Welcome to God of Glory, Kings of Honor Ministries. My name is Reverend Ron James. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, last week, we began looking at who is God thrown away from Romans 11, verses 1 to 6. We're going to complete that message as part two today. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, the theory of who is God thrown away and the past of who is God thrown away. And... Uh, we saw that God's thrown away no one. And today we're going to look at the present and the future. Last week covered uh, verses 1 through 4 in Romans chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 5 and 6 today. Romans 11 verses 1 through 6 says, I say then, has God cast away or thrown away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not thrown away his people, which he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah? How he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and dig down your altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what said the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. He says, even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. God has not thrown away in the present either. In verse 5, he says, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That word election is eklog, and it means selection according to the selection of grace. Now, grace is an inanimate object. So when it's talking about the selection of grace, it's talking about you choosing God's grace. You are the selector of God's grace. God extends his grace out to you. It's up to you to receive it. It's up to you to choose it. You can choose to be a murderer, you can choose to be a thief. You can choose to be a sex offender. You can choose to be an addict. You can choose to be a blasphemer. You can choose to be an atheist. And you can also choose the covenant of God's grace. It's up to you. Who has God thrown away? And the answer is, in the present, as it was in theory and in the past, God has thrown away no one. We throw ourselves away if we don't receive his grace. In Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 23, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says, but now righteousness, but now faith, but now grace is extended unto all. It's up to us to receive it. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 22, it says much the same thing. It says, but the scripture has concluded all under sin. All have sinned. Like Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scriptures concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's the dividing line. We're all guilty. He, he's declared us all guilty before God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who does God throw away out of that group? Nobody. We throw ourselves away if we don't receive his salvation. 
Romans 11:32, my favorite scripture in the whole in the entire Bible, again says the same thing. It says, "For God has concluded them all in unbelief, that He might have mercy upon all." God doesn't have a set of people over here and another set of people over here. He said, "You know what? You're all in unbelief." I extend mercy to you all. I extend salvation to you all. I extend faith unto you all. But you have to receive it. Now, Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 19. Who is God thrown away? Who has God thrown away? And the answer is no one. Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Everybody's guilty, again. Everybody's lost. Everybody is without mercy and without grace and without faith. But it's extended to everyone. As it is written in verse 10, he goes on, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all going out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues have they used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is a daunting list of things that we are all guilty of. And in verse 19, he says, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. We're all guilty. Romans 3.23, Galatians 3.22, Romans 11.32, and Romans 3.19 all say we're all guilty. Who is God thrown away? No one. Not, not in theory with Paul. Not in the past, as we saw last week, and no one now. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He's chosen you. He's chosen everyone. He predestined everyone to be saved. He knew everyone was under sin. He's concluded all under sin. So he provided salvation for everyone. God hasn't thrown away anyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. You have to reach out and receive him as your Savior. He has chosen you. No matter who you are, he's chosen you to be saved. He predestined every person on this planet to be saved. That's his plan. Now, you may interrupt his plan and not receive him. You may not choose his grace. You may not select his grace. You, you may not elect his grace. You may not echelogue his grace. But he's offered it to you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It 
He says, I exhort, therefore, the first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and he himself is the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified, to be preached, to be spoken of, to be witnessed to in due time. God has concluded us all in unbelief and provided salvation for all. It's his will that we all be saved. He predestined all of us to be saved. We have to receive it. And because those things are true, God hasn't thrown away anyone. That's Paul's point in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. He's writing to the Romans about Israel. And he says, don't think that God threw them away. Don't think God cast them out. God did not cast out his people, which he knew before time. God has not cast out any of us either. You have to receive it. Again, Romans 11, 32, God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Paul in, in that portion of scripture is talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. That's the only two groups of people there are. There, there's the house of Israel and everyone else. And he said he's concluded us all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. He didn't throw away Israel. He's not throwing away us. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. God offers grace and mercy and salvation to all. We must choose to accept his grace and mercy and salvation. You can't fail something if it isn't up to you. You can only fail grace by not receiving it. If you don't reach out and take it, then you have failed to receive it. You have failed grace. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. First Thessalonians 1. 1 through 4. It's very important to understand what's being said here. Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica. And he brags on them. And he's telling them just how, in how high regard he holds them. Seven times. He says, you and your. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessal Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brother and beloved, your election of God. And there's a little reference note in my Bible that says your call of God. That word election there is not the word call. That word election there is the word echologue. And it means selection. So he says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your selection of God. You and your. Seven times. 
We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Remember without ceasing your work of faith. It's not faith's work of you. It's your work of faith and your labor of love. Your work of love. And your patience of hope. And your selection of God. You know, you have to do a lot of English gymnastics to get it to say something else. We have to choose his grace. Who is God thrown away? The answer is no one in the present. God has not thrown anyone away. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. It's a very powerful portion of scripture that I want to look at for a few minutes. He says, today, we're talking about who has God thrown away now in the present. We looked at the theory last week and the past last week. Now we're looking at the present and the future. In the present, who has God thrown away? And the answer is no one. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 19, he says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Don't harden your heart. You don't harden your heart. You receive his grace. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcass fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. few things here. He says, today don't harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And he even repeats himself twice. He quotes that portion of scripture twice. Don't harden your hearts. If you hear. Don't harden your heart in the day of temptation. It's up to you. He says in verse 9, Your fathers tempted me. That word tempted in the Greek is parazo, and it means to scrutinize. But that word is taken from the word piera, which means to pierce, to examine, to scrutinize by piercing. Isn't it interesting? that they pierced Jesus Christ with the crown of thorns, and they pierced Jesus Christ's skin with the whip, with the cat of nine tails, and they pierced his skin with the nails, and they pierced him one last time with the spear to make sure he was dead, and blood and water flowed out separately, showing that he was dead. They pierced him. This word says, you scrutinized me. You scrutinized me to the point where you pierced me. You put a fake crown on my head. You put real nails through my wrist. You whipped me with a real whip. And then you took a spear and stuck it in me. In present time, God still has not thrown 
those people away or else away. He goes on and he says, you challenged me. There's a lot of people today that like to challenge God. They like to stand up in God's face and say he doesn't exist. They, they like to stand up in his face and, and, and talk about the grotesque things they do and, and mock people who live godly lives and mock people who believe in the word of God. God's response to that was he was grieved. In verse 10, he says, I was grieved with that generation. He's grieved with this generation. I promise you he's grieved. It bothers him horribly. But he has given us free will. We're free to choose his grace or we're free to be a disgrace. You're free to do what you wish. But heaven or hell hangs in the balance. They always err in their heart. They always err in their heart. They make the wrong decision with their heart. They've not always known my ways. God says in verse 11, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That was true, true of the children of Israel going into the promised land, and it will be true of anyone that doesn't receive him now. In the present time, God still hasn't thrown anyone away, but you can throw yourself away. You can err in your heart. You can grieve God. You can choose to be a disgrace instead of receiving his grace. Verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's where it divides. What kind of heart is in you? You know, Romans chapter 1 talks about from faith to faith. Romans chapter 10, we, we talked about in verse 8, where it talks about the word is near to you. It's even already in your mouth. It's even already in your heart. You have to crush that word. You have to completely turn away from God to not be able to see the gospel message, to not be able to receive Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He says in verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. That word today is samaron in the Greek, and it means now. Exhort one another daily while it is called now. Now, if you hear his voice, now, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Receive him. He says, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will absolutely trick you and make you stupid. You may think that sin is just something you do, but sin is a disease that you have. Sin is a means by which Satan will destroy you if you let him. Verse 14, he says, we are made partakers of Christ if, if, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. There's a couple of really important words there. That word partaker in the Greek is metochos, and it means participants. We are made participants of Christ. 
It's an act of faith. It's a faith that does things. It's a faith that studies the word of God. It's a faith that prays. It's a faith that witnesses. It's a faith that you pray for the sick and they get healed. It's a faith that is active. It's not something to be shined up and set on a shelf and never used. It is a verb. We are participants in Christ. We're, we're, we're not part of the audience. We're active participants if we're doing this right. He says, if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that word confidence is hypostasis. It means setting under of assurance. It's like having girders under your faith. It's like having girders under your life that hold you up, that, that fasten you in place, that keep you safe, that keep you strong. No matter what comes along, those girders aren't going to let you go any place. They're going to fight against the flood and the wind, whatever may come your way. He said, we're active participants and we have girders of assurance under us. If we hold steadfast unto the end, you can't let go. You can't let go. He repeats again what he said in verse 7 and verse 15. Today, don't harden your hearts. He says, some in verse 16, when they heard, did provoke. That is the word para pecreno, and it means to exasperate. They exasperated God. They provoked God. He was exasperated. He'd done all these things for them. He'd led them out of slavery. He led them through the Red Sea. He led them away from their captives and into the land that he'd promised to them. And they turned away anyway. And God was exasperated with them. It says in verse 17, with whom was he grieved? Was it not with them that sin that was on them that was on them it was up to them to not sin it was up to them to not fall into unbelief it was up to them to receive God's grace and God's mercy and to walk in faith and to be participants of that faith but they didn't they turned away and sinned to who is God thrown away in the present? God hasn't thrown away anyone by theory, as we saw with Paul. God hasn't thrown away anyone in the past, as we saw in verses 1 through 4 of Romans 11. God hasn't thrown away anyone in the present, as we saw in verse 5, God hasn't cast away anyone in the future. Who has God thrown away? The answer is still no one. In verse 6 of Romans chapter 11, Romans 11. Verse 6, he says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it's by grace, then it's yours for the asking. If it's a gift, it's provided to everyone, as we saw. In Romans 3, 21 through 23, 
as we saw in Romans 3, 19, or 9 through 19. As we saw in Galatians 3, 22. As we saw in Romans eleven thirty two. If it be by grace, and it is, then it's yours for the asking. If by grace, then it's no more of works. It's a gift. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 1. says, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, that's Israel, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and the strangers, that's the Gentiles, shall be joined with them, and they shall unite to the house of Israel, to the house of Jacob. He says, and he will yet choose Israel. That's future. Israel's come back into their own land. That prophecy was fulfilled in 1948. He said that in the future, Israel and the Gentiles will be joined together in one faith. All that come to faith in Jesus Christ are joined together. We're all Christians now. We're not Jews, we're not Gentiles, we're Christians. We're born-again Christians. He had mercy on Israel. He died for their sins. He chose Israel before the foundation of the world. He chose the Gentiles before the foundation of the world. He set Israel in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them spiritually. They shall unite with the house of Israel. And all that are saved are united in Christ. We're all active participants if we're doing this right in Christ. We've gone from death to life. And life is an activity. It's not just an existence. In Acts chapter 4. Verse 33. Acts 4 33. It says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. With great power. With great authority with signs and miracles and wonders and with the word of God. And that verse concludes, and great grace was upon them all because they received it. It was upon them all. Great grace. Now there's three portions of scripture I want to read quickly to show you something I think is very important. Exodus 32, verses 31 to 33. Exodus 32, 31 to 33. It says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, Moses is making intercession for those people before God. He's asking God to forgive them. He says, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray you, out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Very important. Moses was in the book of life. Moses said, 
if you won't do this, if you won't save them, take me out of the book too. Telling me that they were all in the book and Moses is vouching for them saying, if, if you take them out, if you cast them all away, if you throw them all away, throw me away too. And God said, it's incumbent upon whoever did it to be thrown out. This was not set up ahead of time by God. God said, if they sin against me, them I'll blot out. In other words, they're in the book. But if they turn away from me, they'll be blotted out. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Revelation 3, 5 says, He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus said, in talking to the church at Sardis, he said, Him that overcomes, you're going to be clothed in white. You're going to be seen as pure and holy in God's sight. And I won't blot out your name out of the book. The name's in the book. For the name to be blotted out of the book, they have to turn away. They have to not receive his grace. They have to not receive his mercy. Because he offered it to them. One more scripture, Revelation 22, 19, says, And if any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You can be blotted out. You can be blotted out and it can be taken away. That which is offered to you, that mercy and forgiveness and grace that is offered to everyone can be withdrawn if you don't receive him. That is how people end up in hell. They don't receive heaven. God literally doesn't send anyone to hell. You send yourself. He, he extends the offer of eternal life to each person. But each person has to receive it. They have to receive and overcome. You know, Jesus, when he was speaking to the seven churches, had a message for every one of them. He said, to him that overcomes, in Revelation 2, 7, to him that overcomes in Revelation 2.11. To him that overcomes 2.17. To him that overcomes 2.26. To him that overcomes in 3.5. To him that overcomes in 3.12. To him that overcomes in 3.21. Over and over and over again, he says, overcome. Re receive my grace. Receive my mercy and overcome Satan and sin. Overcome this world by my salvation. Revelation 21, 7. He says again, To him that overcomes, and he shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, he says, But the fearful, and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He offers it to you. Who is God thrown away? No one. Not in theory, not in past, not in present, and not in the future. But you can throw yourself away. very powerful portion of scripture I want to close with is in Romans chapter 5. 
verse 20. Romans 5, 20. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Talking about sin. That sin might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I did a whole sermon on this months ago. Where sin abounded, the grace overwhelmed sin. That phrase, much more abound, is polis malin huperperliasio. It means much and in greater degree and to superabound over, above, and beyond. What's he saying? That God's grace overwhelms sin. It didn't forge a tie. It didn't barely outdo sin. It didn't fall short of sin, and sin overwhelmed it. He said, where sin abounded, grace did much in greater degree over, above, and beyond superabound. Now, I've shared this with you before, but I love reminiscing. When I was a kid, they invented something called a Super Bowl. A regular ball, you'd bounce and bounce a few feet off the ground. But they invented a super compressed ball that was literally called a Super Bowl. And you could bounce that thing and it would bounce clear over your house. And that's what grace did. It super abounded over and above and beyond anything that sin did. And all you have to do is receive his grace and receive his forgiveness and receive his mercy. It is offered to you. And if you've done that, I would remind you of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, where he says, We are made partakers of Christ, participants of Christ. You can't just sit and not witness. You can't just sit and not pray. You can't just sit and not study the scripture. You can't as a believer. You have to be partakers of Christ, active participants in this. The word of God says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. If you don't believe anything, then shut your mouth. Don't, don't prove to everybody what you don't believe. But if you believe, it's incumbent upon you to open your mouth and to witness for Jesus Christ. You're to be an active participant. If you believe, speak. Let the words that come out of your mouth be holy and acceptable before God. Who is God thrown away? In theory, no one. In the past, no one. In the present, no one. And in the future, no one. But those that are lost threw themselves away. Uh, I've told this to people many times, but you know, Jesus said, those that my Father's given me are in my Father's hands, and no man can take them out. And that is true. But you can let yourself out. You know, the, there's no doorknob on the outside of that door. There, there's a very famous painting. I don't remember who did it. I don't remember what the painting's called, but it shows Jesus knocking on the door. And there's no doorknob on the outside of the door. And a friend of the man that painted the picture said, you messed up. He didn't put a knob on the outside of that door. And he said, no, I, I didn't mess up. That's an accurate depiction. The only way in to that door, that entranceway, is from the inside of the person's heart. That's the only way it can be opened. You have to open your heart to God. You have to open your mind to God. You have to receive Him. 
he's not going to force his way in and he's not going to throw you away if you want to receive him but you can throw yourself away you can open the God's hands and throw yourself out you cannot open that door and let Jesus in but it's up to you would you bow with me for a closing prayer please Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word today. It's a great blessing to me. I hope that whoever listens to it, it's a great blessing to them. The word of God is, is alive and powerful and, and sharper than any two-edged sword, as the word says. It will clean up everything in your life if you let it. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Savior or if you are backslidden and want to come into a, a, a participant role in the things of Christ, be partakers of him, participants of him, I'd ask you to pray this prayer with me and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that your shed blood is the one-time perfect sacrifice for sin on that cross and that you paid the price for the sins of the whole world i receive you just now i want to be a born-again christian i want to leave my sin at the foot of the cross and go away a changed person if any man be in christ he is a new creation old things are passed away behold all things are become new that's what I want. I want to be a new creature in Jesus Christ. I don't want to go on living like I've been living. I need you, Lord Jesus. I ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next week. Brother James is going on vacation. The next message will come out a couple of days later. I usually do these on Friday. We won't be back until uh, Saturday night, so we'll be doing it on Sunday. So if you're watching this, be patient. The next message will be coming up shortly. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Amen.